um, I'm going to be talking to you about a uh, scenario, a scenario that's becoming reality really, really very fast. And it's about the information that's swamping us. It's very fast, it's very cheap, and it's making all of us very connected. And it's changing our world so much that you might as well throw out your own uh, strategy book and your own economics book and really start getting ready for, um, for, this, uh, for this new world. To think about this uh, wave of information constructively, I found it's very helpful to split it in two trends. One about more information, what economists might call more perfect information. I put it in quotation marks because of course it's never going to be perfect. But what it does, it makes markets work better. It takes away asymmetry of information. It enables a lot of different things that companies can do because they can coordinate more easily, they can monitor more easily, you can construct really complex contracts more easily. But on the other hand, there is this really interesting phenomenon that is that as we learn more and more and more, we know more about other people and other actions, our decisions become interdependent. And that's causing a lot of inefficiencies, which makes things really very interesting, which means that when we throw out the old textbook, we have to think of a new economic paradigm, and that's based on the network dynamics that come from this interdependent decision making. Um, so this new model is possible not just in the high technology industry, but also in the consumer goods industry. Uh, next time you take a can of Coke or a can of uh, Pepsi, take a look and see where it's made. It's not made in Atlanta, the home base of Coca-Cola, or in uh, Purchase, New York, the home base of Pepsi. It's probably made by a bottler really near you. All that a company like a Coca-Cola or Pepsi does is it provides the brand, the concentrate, the secret ingredient, but it's the bottlers that do all the hard work. They have to work with the unions. They have to make sure the water isn't polluted. They have to buy the plastic, take care of the prices in the aluminum market. And in return for all that work, you see the disparity. You can see Coca-Cola, the parent company, who do relatively little, get a huge return of like 25% return on invested capital. And the bottlers who do all this hard work, they get returns that are, whether it's 2%, 3% in the single digits. It's one place where you have that, that golden nugget. And that's where the profit power resides. And that's what I call a power node. A power node is that part of the system that um, allow, if you own it, you can control the rest of the system because you have something special that allows you to hold on to your profit and also get something from the profit of all the, of the companies all around you. So in this day and age, why it's different now is because of this freedom of information, this availability of information, you can actually focus on the part of the system that has the profit power. And by owning just that piece, you can have the highest return on invested capital. So here we have seen some examples of what we can do with this so-called perfect information. It allows you to, to focus on the part of a company or of an industry that has the profit power. It allows you to reshuffle your business model. And it also, once you take all these companies apart, obviously you have a lot of interfaces, surfaces of competition that you never had before. So you have to think about these new forms of, uh, of competition. So uh, what I'd like you to take away from this is that this interdependent decision making changes the way that groups behave and changes the dynamics in marketplaces. They become these marketplaces where you have super popular hubs, somewhat popular hubs, and then really very much nothing, nothing else. So that's why we have to really change the way we think about economics. We have to change our economics rules because many of our textbooks don't even have, you know, halfway um, any of this kind of information. And most of them were written in the time, you know, before there was even a phone line, direct phone line between, you know, the White House and the Kremlin. And we have a lot of work done on imperfect information, which of course is no longer applicable. I mean, we're in a swamp of information kind of world. So that's why you really need to then also develop a new strategy playbook. You know, if you can own anything you want in the structure of all these pieces in a company, you know, where can you find those power nodes? 
then how can you organize yourself with all these new degrees of freedom you have? And then what does it mean for competition? You know, of course, all our competition models are based on these vertical columns competing against each other. It obviously doesn't apply. So power nodes will see are the sources of profits, but also the sources of competitive uh, strength as we go on. Um, as you know, in my book, I've identified 12 power nodes. The first eight are, are, posi are positions or their skills or their strengths. And some of them are new or some of them are old. You just can use them now in very new ways. The old economics, which you know, people just recently, like for instance, Oliver Williamson, who was a great economist, but just got a Nobel Prize for, is to talk about this kind of options that companies have. You can be either vertically integrated or you can be completely loose. But what actually is a lot more interesting is this middle ground where you can orchestrate a collection of loose companies all around you because you have the power node. And orchestrating these relationships where you are the power node company, you have the highest return on invested capital, and all the other ones do whatever you need to get done to get your product to the market, to get your materials, etc. To manage those relationships is a real important skill that we need to develop. You know, you can go across these layers, and what you can see companies that are successful will be able to drive through a number of industries. So being focused doesn't mean you have to be small. It means you can go across a lot of industries if you figure out where the profit power lies. Um, we already know that, or we've already alluded to the fact that when you get this interdependent decision making, the behavior changes and you get uh, power law distributions and these hubs. Some of the characteristics of these power law network uh, dynamics that you should use and be careful of. Don't expect long tails, expect fat tails, meaning the probability of real disaster is bigger than you might assume if you just use the normal distribution. You must deploy new strategies if you want to be successful and try to focus your ownership on power nodes. Figure out how you can deploy the continuum of business models. You have a lot of degrees of freedom. You can structure your arrangements any which way you choose. Be aware you've got to fight in three dimensions, and you've got to be ready for power law marketplaces. And here, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to announce uh, Coast Timmermans, who has kindly agreed to um, give his comments and to tell us about uh, what um, he is doing with the management at ING. He's the chief risk officer of ING and a member of their executive board. With this with and ING, I'd like to first share a little bit like, like, okay, the contextual part, like what is happening in the banking landscape, and then we'll come back to these particular issues. Now, let me take two things uh, in here. One is, what have we seen in October, November 08? What we have seen is that information is spreading tremendously quickly. So in other words, where people maybe did not know a thing about a deposit guarantee scheme, through the internet, through the news, what you find is, you know, in two nanoseconds, people find out what it is, how much it is, how quick it is paid out. And then, you know, you should not underestimate your customer from that angle. If that information travels so quickly, then you know that, you know, if we take our organization, we have more than 500 billion in deposits, and those deposits, people, they were concerned about that. If they were concerned, then you need to think further and say, like, well, what kind of companies do we have in our group? We have a bank and we have an insurance company. On the bank side, you cannot have a lot of news. You don't want spectacular results, either very positive or very, well, very positive is fine, but certainly not very negative, because you're relying on your deposit base. You look at an insurance company, it's a different story. In an insurance company, you have clients who give their money for a longer period of time, and they expect you to invest it. And they also accept more fluctuating results there. Having the two under one roof, is that a good thing? Uh, and here, one of the things is like this transparency of information and the quickness with which these, the information travels plays a big role in thinking further, like how will this move? I mean, we are going through a huge, train, a huge uh, amount of change. At the same time, we see that right now that is necessary. I mean, markets, they are, since the crisis, they are changing, and they ask you and they force you to change. Uh, we have taken some of these things into consideration, like how is that speed of information moving, and what does that mean for your customer going forward, and how is that reacting to bank and insurance, and taken our decision there to say, like, well, you know, we want to split. 
And at the same time, we do think that these companies on their own, they do have clearly their reason to exist and they do have clearly their niche in a market where they can prosper. So executing this will still be a lot of work for us, but at the same time, it is reacting to your 21st century business model. And that is, I think, where we will go to.